Hello everyone. Namaste and hope you are doing well. In this video, let us talk about the recruitment process at the United Nations and other international organizations. We will discuss about the standard process and some practical pointers out of my own experience and gather through discussion from others who have been in the system since long. The structure of the video is as shown here. We will talk about the different kind of staff positions, where to search for these staff positions, how to apply, some details about the written test, competency based interviews, rostering and certain other miscellaneous points such as how can government servants apply. First of all, let us see what all positions does UN recruit for. UN and other international organizations are also called as international governments. So you can imagine they have all different kind of job openings the way we have it in our national governments. UN recruits for uh, project managers, economists, psychologists, librarians, drivers, investigators, public relations officers and of course auditors. You name it and it is there. The location of these vacancies would vary depending upon the requirement of these professionals across the globe. So while searching, you may search a vacancy which is uh, from your area of ex expertise as well as keeping in mind your locational preferences. The next logical question is, where do I search for these job vacancies? There are two sources to check for these openings. The main source of these opening are the organizational websites while the second source are the certain aggregator portals which publish these openings. Let me detail a bit. For the first kind, the organizational websites, for United Nations we have a portal called as Inspira which publishes the job openings related to United Nations. Similarly, ILO. Uh, jobs.int for International Labor Organization or ILO, careers.who.int for World Health Organization or WHO and similarly for other organizations. For the second category that I mentioned as aggregator portals, the links are shown here. These are certain portals which collect information from different organizations and paste them and publish them at their own portal. So I must forewarn that these portals are not the official source of this information. So it is always good to go to the first source that I had mentioned, the organizational websites and check for the exact details of the job openings. But if you are starting to look for jobs in international organization, I would suggest that you make use of these aggregator portals for the fact that it is much easier to browse across different kind of job openings at one single place rather than jumping between different organizations. You can also create accounts on these aggregator portals. You can put certain filters of your preference, for example, the location, your area of expertise, the kind of employment you are looking at, fixed term, temporary, all those kind of different uh, classifications. And based on the filters that you have chosen and, and the alerts that you have created, whenever there is a job opening which matches these filters, you will automatically get a mail. Which means it becomes handy, it becomes easier to browse to different kind of job openings given the fact that there are so many job openings coming out every day. Now that you know where to look for these job openings, let us take a look at how to apply for different kind of positions. Though, I must submit one thing for your information that there are no standard rules for these recruitment processes as to how many stages will be present in the process or not. It completely depends on the recruitment manager for that particular exercise to decide on the number of stages that he or she wants to keep for that recruitment process. But almost in all the recruitment exercises that have taken place recently, there are three stages. First of all is the application stage, second one a written exam and third one is the interview which we call as competency based interview. Back to the first stage that is the application stage. Most of the applications these days are online in nature and it is through the portal of the organization for which you are applying 
that these applications can be submitted. In this stage, there are a few points that you can keep in mind to increase the chances of selection. You will be asked to submit a CV or resume for the opening. Please make sure that you highlight those points in your CV which align more with the job opening. I have seen some of us making one CV and using it across different kind of openings, which is not a great thing to do. It is to be understood that even this application stage is a selection stage, qualifying which we will move on to the next round, which normally is the return round. For example, if I were applying for an IT auditor's post, though I will mention all the audit experience collected in these years, I will put more stress on the IT part. Alternatively, if I were applying for a lead auditor's post, the person who leads an audit team, though I will mention all the audit experience, at the same time I will highlight the HR manager role more. So please make sure you align your CV and the cover letter with the vacancy at hand. Second point that I want to bring to your notice regarding the application stage is about mentioning the licenses or certifications in your CV from your area of expertise. Like I mentioned before, even the application stage is qualifying in nature because the people who are applying for these job vacancies are far too many in number and not everyone can be invited for the subsequent rounds. Though this is never publicly declared because examination processes are confidential in nature, but it is generally understood that the certifications from your area of expertise play an important role in crossing this initial hurdle of the application stage. And it seems logical. Just imagine if someone was given 5000 applications and asked to choose say 100 out of them for the next round, it would put anyone in a difficult situation. While the rest of the experience and achievements in the CV are of subjective nature and difficult to compare across so many candidates, these international certifications provide for an objective as well as universally agreed benchmarks for such comparative scrutiny. Area of work that is auditing, a certified internal auditor that is CIA or Certified Information Systems Auditor that is CISA or Certified Fraud Examiner that is CFE are some of the certifications which strengthen the application. In fact, there are certain vacancies in which these certifications, some of these, are asked as a mandatory requirement. And where will you find as to what uh, certifications are desirable or required in a job vacancy? These are very clearly mentioned in the job opening as to whether these are desirable or mandatory required. I will request you to please get certified in some of these international certifications uh, pertaining to your area of expertise in case you aim to work for the international organizations. Now coming to the next round which is the written exam. These days most of the written exams are done through the online portals which means typing speed is a deciding factor. It would not matter how much one knew if the person was not able to type everything in the stipulated time. Some of the organizations also use multiple choice questions for the written exam. The written exam is aimed at judging our domain knowledge. So please carefully read through the areas which are mentioned in the job opening. The candidates are bound by the non-disclosure clause, so I will not be going into the exact details of the questions which were asked in the two exams that I have written. But to explain the area of detail that you can expect in the written exam, uh, I, can, I can take an example that if you are applying for an IT related post, you may actually be asked to code or write SQL queries. So please don't expect generic questions in the examination. These are very much detailed relating to the area that which has been mentioned in the job opening clearly. So first thing would be to read the job opening very clearly and the second thing would be to work thoroughly on these areas which have already been highlighted by the vacancy. Moving on 
to the most interesting part of the recruitment process, the interview. In international organizations, the modality for interview is known as competence-based interview or CBI. Unlike past interviews which you may have faced where anything under the sun can be asked, the interviews in international organizations are very structured. Like the name says, competence-based interview. Here the candidates are judged on certain competencies or skills which are clearly mentioned in the job vacancy document. Normally, one vacancy targets three to four uh, competencies. Nor uh, the, the most commonly sought competencies are professionalism, respect for diversity, communication, teamwork, uh, client orientation and communication. You may read more about competencies, CBI and the related questions from the links displayed here. During the interview, you will be asked certain situational and behavioral questions relating to the competency which have been mentioned in the job vacancy. For example, uh, if professionalism is one of the competencies being sought by the job opening, you may be asked something like, uh, tell me a time when you worked especially harder in your current role. There can be sub-questions, tell us uh, what motivated you or what demotivated you. Now your response should clearly contain three things. One, what was the situation? Two, what did you do? Three, what was the outcome? If your response clearly contains these three parts, it will be considered a complete and relevant response. Having covered the different stages of a sample recruitment process, let me now discuss some other issues. First of all, what is rostering? Rostering is a process by which uh, certain high-performing candidates are placed on a roster or a buffer to be considered for the next recruitment process without going the entire rigor of the next recruitment process. Let me take an example. Uh, say an organization wanted to recruit two people, like they had two job vacancies and they recruited two candidates. At the same time, they found that the remain the next three candidates are also very deserving, um, they, who have performed very well in the recruitment process, but they could not be selected. Here, one thing is to be understood that the selection in international organizations is not always driven by the merit alone, it's not always driven by the performance in that recruitment process alone. Let me explain. There are other factors which are also into play such as gender parity and representation of less represented nations. For example, maybe a candidate has performed very well in an examination, in a recruitment process, but he or she belongs to a nation which is already highly represented in that organization. In that situation, there are all chances that this candidate would not be selected. But to be fair to this candidate, he or she is placed on this roster or buffer which is called roster for that position. In layman's term, roster can be considered to be a wait listing or a wait list for the high performing ca candidates. But it is to be understood that being on roster is absolutely no guarantee for selection in future recruitment processes. It is completely a decision on the recruitment manager for the future recruitment processes to take a call whether he or she wants to select somebody from the rec from the roster or whether they want to go for a fresh full recruitment process so one thing is definite being rostered for a position is a plus point on your cv whenever you are applying for a similar position in future next let us take a closer look at the competency-based interviews. The link displayed here mentions a list of sample interview questions relating to all the competencies that may be mentioned in the job vacancies. Now that you have a list of sample questions with you, I'll request you to prepare your responses to these sample questions and rehearse them well before entering the interview. 
The benefit of already prepared responses is that your responses will be concise, which will allow for more discussion with the interviewers. And greater the discussion with the interviewers, higher are the chances of selection. This goes true for any interview process, not just for UN. Another point which holds true for any interview and not just for United Nations. Uh, if you find uh, a situation which you have never faced and you are asked about a situation like that, please be honest and submit it honestly to the interviewers that you have not faced this situation. You can always give them an option of a similar situation that you have faced. Now the ball is in their court, whether they want to hear from you on this similar situation or whether they want to move to the next question. But an honest submission is always better than a made-up response. See, you are not just being judged on what you know, but also how do you handle a situation when you do not know the answer. And if, the, if you come out to be an honest candidate, it is a plus point for the interview. Next issue I would like to touch upon is the application by government servants. If you are a Government of India servant and wish to work for United Nations or other international organizations, please make sure that you get uh, acquainted uh, with the government instructions in this regard. There are clear guidelines and procedures to be followed, starting from getting clearance from your cadre control authority for applying to these vacancies and so forth. Having faced a rigorous process like UPSC, I'm sure that you hold a bright chance of clearing these uh, selection processes. Also, working for a government of India brings vast experience. Uh, which adds a strong point to the CV, thereby increasing chances of selection. Though I must play a bit of devil's advocate here and highlight two points which require attention of Indian candidates and especially those coming from the government. Uh, I touched upon this point when I was talking about rostering. I mentioned that it is not always that the meritorious candidate is the one who gets selected. There are other considerations such as gender parity and uh, allowing candidates from nations which are not very well represented in the UN. Uh, the UN and other international organizations are aiming at creating a workforce which is more representative of certain parameters such as gender or uh, individuals who are coming from nations which are not very well represented. Uh, so, it may happen that uh, an, a recruitment process is targeting to recruit a women or they are uh, aiming at recruiting somebody from a nation which is not very well represented currently. Now, India is supposed to be a nation which has considerable representation in UN and in other international organizations. This may go against for future selection of the Indian candidates. For example, there is a program of UN to hire young talent known as the Young Professionals Program. This program uh, targets people of uh, less than or equal to 32 years of age. Every year, UN comes with a list of nations, citizens of which are eligible to apply for this program. Now, India has not been on this list of Young Professionals Program for last few years. Uh, considering that uh, there is already optimum presence of India in UN uh, and other international organizations. Now whether this is justified or not is not something that I am aiming to discuss in the video. My point is that uh, don't be discouraged if despite uh, one's best effort he or she is not able to make it through the selection process. There are parameters and considerations outside one's uh, control which may be deciding the final selection. At the same time, I would like to state that please don't let these external parameters bother yourself. I am myself an example of this situation where two external not so favorable parameters were sitting on my CV. I am Indian and I am a male. Uh, and like I already mentioned that the international organizations are striving for creating gender parity in the workforce which means they are prioritizing female candidates over male, candi uh, male candidates and also they are uh, prioritizing candidates from less represented nations. So uh, uh, yet I could uh, clear this uh, selection process. So the point is uh, selection for Indian candidates especially male 
may be difficult but it is not impossible so once you take a call that you are uh, planning to apply for these organizations please keep these factors out of your head no external factor dilutes your preparation more than uh, internal lack of conviction so you should know about these points because these are real these are realities to know but at the same time please do not uh, let them dampen your preparation the second point that i want to mention about indian candidates especially from government of india relates to the work profile in un and other international organizations uh, the civil servants at my level are part of the middle management layer in government of india and uh, mostly have supervisory role with very few avenues of first hand work uh, by first hand work here i mean something that you are doing on your own starting from the scratch uh, first hand work in government of india is normally done by those present in the field say audit officers tehsildars etc then they submit this work for scrutiny at the middle management layer uh, the level where i was working and then the file moves up to the to, to the higher levels of hierarchy the organizational hierarchy in un and other international organizations is comparatively much flatter which means that people at my level are mostly involved in first hand work uh, something like uh, individual contributors or ics in corporate entities so if you have got in a habit of only doing supervisory role uh, you will need a shift of gears uh, and i'm very sure that uh, would not be a problem for you but please make sure that you keep this important uh, factor in mind if you are planning to apply for the united uh, nations and other international organizations because it would really be a sad thing to to fight your way through the tough international competition reach here and then be taken aback by this change in organizational culture with this we come to the end of this video i hope the broad contours of the recruitment process at the united nations and other international organizations are clear please feel free to ask queries or uh, make suggestions for the video content uh, with a young kid at home who is the center of all my attention i'll try to answer as much as possible in a reasonable time amidst all these aspirations failures success achievements make sure that you are looking after your health both emotional and physical and th that that is the most important aspect of our life so please take very good care of yourself thank you so much for sharing your time apna khayal rakhiye